This is London. Judgment at Nuremberg. Here is John Snag to introduce recordings made today direct from the BBC studio in the courthouse at Nuremberg. We begin our report of the second and final judgment day at Nuremberg with a dispatch from Chester Wilmot just as the court was opening this morning. Overhead, the glaring photographic lights beat down upon the thronged courtroom, showing up every line in the faces of the men who have spent most of the last ten months in this same dock. All eyes are upon them, and as I look down, they seem to me to be shifting a little on their seats in uneasy expectation. Some of them are talking together. Uh, one, Frick, is standing up in the front row, gazing round the court. A yodel is rubbing his hands together because there's quite a sharp nip in the air this morning and the heating of the court is not as great as usual. Uh, Fear is leaning forward, head in his hand, in a contemplative mood, looking out across towards the bench. Uh, Goering is talking uh, quietly to one of the country who has just come in and behind him, Dermot and Rader are chatting together. Rosenberg is laying down the law to Frank at some point, hammering with his hand on his knee as he stresses the, the argument that he is making. Frank, uh, hiding his eyes from the glare behind his glasses, is sitting next to him, uh, rubbing his hands together. Most of the defendants have undergone a mass change since the trial began last November. Today they look drawn and tired, as though their reserves of nervous energy have been drawn from them by the strain of sitting in this dock month after month and listening to the relentless accumulation of the evidence against them. At first, they thought to question the tribunal's right to try them. But from the opening day, the president established its impartial and judicial approach. Soon, even though in their hearts they may still have challenged its jurisdiction, in their behavior, they accepted its authority. And now they sit waiting quietly, uh, sedately, and subdued, waiting for the verdict. At the tables occupied by counsel for the prosecution, General Rudenko, the senior Russian prosecutor, has just been engaged in conversation through an interpreter with Mr. Justice Jackson, uh, who headed the prosecuting counsel for the United States. Uh, sitting at the uh, table of the British prosecution is Shahat Lushoka, the Attorney General, Mr. David Maxwell Price, the former Solicitor General, who has uh, conducted some of the most skillful and penetrating and damaging cross-examination in this trial. And now the Marshal calls the court to order, and in a moment or two, the judges will walk through the door beside the bench. And now some extracts from the findings. In the background of these recordings, you'll hear the voices of the interpreters. Lord Justice Lawrence pronounced the finding on Goering. The defendant Goering. Goering is indicted on all four counts. The evidence shows that after Hitler, he was the most prominent man in the Nazi regime. He testified that Hitler kept him informed of all important military and political problems. Crimes against peace. From the moment he joined the party in 1922 and took command of the street fighting organization, PSA, Goering was the advisor, the active agent of Hitler, and one of the prime leaders of the Nazi movement. He developed the Gestapo and created the first concentration camps. In 1936, he became plenipotentiary for the four-year plan. And in theory, and in practice, was the economic dictator of the Reich. Shortly after the pact of Munich, he announced that he would embark on a five-fold expansion of the Luftwaffe and speed rearmament with emphasis on offensive weapons. Goering attended the Reich Chancellor meeting of the 23rd of May, 1939, when Hitler told his military leaders, there is therefore no question of sparing both and was present at the Obersalzberg briefing of the 22nd of August, 1939. He commanded the Luftwaffe in the attack on Poland and throughout the aggressive wars which followed. Even if he opposed Hitler's plans against Norway and the Soviet Union, as he alleged, it is clear that he did so only for strategic reasons. <coughs> Once Hitler had decided the issue, he followed him without hesitation. After his own admissions to this tribunal, 
from the positions which he held, the conferences he attended, and the public words he uttered, there can remain no doubt that Goering was the moving force for aggressive war, second only to Hitler. He was the planner and prime mover in the military and diplomatic preparation for war which Germany pursued. By decree of the 31st of July, 1941, he directed Himmler and Heydrich to bring about a complete solution of the Jewish question in the Ge German sphere of influence in Europe. There is nothing to be said in mitigation. On some specific cases, there may be a conflict of death. But in terms of the broad outline, his own admissions are more than sufficiently wide to be conclusive of his guilt. His guilt is unique in its enormity. The record discloses no excuses for this man. Conclusion. The tribunal finds the defendant Goering guilty on all four counts of the indictment. The finding on Hess was delivered by General Nikitchenko, the judge of the Soviet Union. Unfortunately, the quality of the reception does not make it possible for us to broadcast his voice, but here is a translation of an essential passage of the tribunal's finding. That Hess acts in an abnormal manner, suffers from loss of memory, and has mentally deteriorated during his this trial may be true. But there is nothing to show that he does not realize the nature of the charges against him or is incapable of defending himself. There is no suggestion that Hess was not completely sane when the acts charged against him were committed. The tribunal finds the defendant Hess guilty on counts one and two and not guilty on counts three and four. The finding on Ribbentrop was pronounced by the United States judge, the Honorable Mr. Francis Biddle. He said, crimes against peace. Ribbentrop was not present at the Hausbach conference held on November 5th, 1937, but on January 2nd, 1938, while still ambassador to England, he sent a memorandum to Hitler indicating his opinion that a change in the status quo in the East, in the German sense, could only be carried out by force and suggesting methods to prevent England and France from intervening in a European war or to bring about a change. After the Munich Pact, he continued to bring diplomatic pressure with the object of occupying the remainder of Czechoslovakia. He was instrumental in using the Slovaks to proclaim their independence. He was present at the conference of March 1415-1939, at which Hitler, by threats of invasion, compelled, compelled President Erhard to consent to the German occupation of Czechoslovakia. After the German troops had marched in, Ribbentrop signed the law establishing the protectorate over Bohemia and Moravia. Ribbentrop played a particularly significant role in the diplomatic activity which led up to the attack in Poland. He participated in the conference held on August 12, 1939, for the purpose of obtaining Italian support if the attack should lead to a general European war. Ribbentrop was advised in advance of the attack on Norway and Denmark and of the attack on the Low Countries and prepared the official Foreign Office memoranda attempting to justify these aggressive actions. 25th, 1941, when Yugoslavia had here to the Axis tripartite pact, Ribbentrop had assured Yugoslavia that Germany would respect its sovereignty and territorial integrity. On March 27, 1941, he attended the meeting held after the coup d'etat in Yugoslavia, at which plans were made to carry out Hitler's announced intention to destroy Yugoslavia. War crimes and crimes against humanity. Ribbentrop participated in the meeting of June 6, 1944, at which it was agreed to start a program under which Allied aviators carrying out 
machine gun attacks on the civilian population should be lynched. In December 1944, Ribbentrop was informed of the plans to murder one of the French generals, held as a prisoner of war, and directed his subordinates to see that the details were worked out in such a way as to prevent his protection by the protecting powers. He played an important part in Hitler's final solution of the Jewish question. In September 1942, he ordered the German diplomatic representatives accredited to various Axis satellites to hasten the deportation of Jews to the East. In June 1942, the German ambassador to Vichy requested Laval to turn over 50,000 Jews for deportation to the East. On February 25th, 1943, Ribbentrop protested to Mussolini against Italian slowness in deporting Jews from the Italian occupation zone of France. On April 17, 1943, he took part in a conference between Hitler and Horthy on the deportation of Jews from Hungary and informed Horthy that the Jews must either be exterminated or taken to concentration camps. At the same conference, Hitler had likened the Jews to tuberculosis bacilli and said if they did not work, they would be shot. Ribbentrop's defense to these charges made against him is that Hitler made all the important decisions and that he was such a great admirer and faithful follower of Hitler that he never questioned Hitler's repeated assertions that he wanted peace or the truth of the reasons that Hitler gave in explaining aggressive action. The tribunal does not consider this explanation to be true. It was because Hitler's policy and plan coincided with his own ideas that Ribbentrop served him so willingly to the end. Conclusion. The tribunal finds that Ribbentrop is guilty on all four counts. Lord Justice Lawrence pronounced the finding on Julius Stryker. Stryker. Stryker is indicted on counts one and four. One of the earliest members of the Nazi party, joining in 1921, he took part in the Munich Putsch. From 1925 to 1940, he was Gauleiter of Franconia. Elected to the Reichstag in 1933, he was an honorary general of the SA. His persecution of the Jews was notorious. He was the publisher of Der Stoma, an anti-Semitic weekly newspaper from 1923 to 1945, and was its editor until 1933. Crimes against humanity. For his 25 years of speaking, writing, and preaching hatred of the Jews, Stryker was widely known as Jew Beta Number One. In his speeches and articles, week after week, month after month, he infected the German mind with the virus of anti-Semitism and incited the German people to active persecution. Each issue of Der Stürmer, which reached a circulation of 600,000 in 1935, was filled with such articles, often lewd and disgusting. Stryker had charge of the Jewish boycott of April the 1st, 1933. He advocated the Nuremberg Decrees of 1935. He was responsible for the demolition on August 10, 1938 of the synagogue in Nuremberg. And on November 10, 1938, he spoke publicly in support of the Jewish program, which was taking place at that time. And it was not only in Germany that this defendant advocated his doctrines. As early as 1938, he began to call for the annihilation of the Jewish race. Twenty-three different articles of Der Sturmer between 1938 and 1941 were produced in evidence. In which extermination, root and branch, was preached. Other articles urged that only when world jury had been annihilated would the Jewish problem have been solved, and predicted that 50 years hence, the Jewish grave will proclaim that this people of murderers and criminals has after all met its 
deserved fate. Stryker in February 1940 published a letter for one of Der Sturmer's readers which compared Jews with swarms of locusts which must be exterminated completely. Such was the poison Stryker injected into the minds of thousands of Germans which caused them to follow an national socialist policy of Jewish persecution and extermination. Testifying in this trial, he vehemently denied any knowledge of mass executions of Jews. But the evidence makes it clear that he continually received current information on the progress of the final solution. His press photographer was sent to visit the ghettos of the East in the spring of 1943, the time of the destruction of the Warsaw Ghetto. The Jewish newspaper, Israelitische Bogenblatt, which Stryker received and read, carried in each issue accounts of Jewish atrocities in the East and gave figures on the number of Jews who had been deported and killed. For example, issues appearing in the summer and fall of 1942 reported the death of 72,729 Jews in Warsaw. 17,542 in Lodz, 18,000 in Croatia, 125,000 in Romania, 14,000 in Latvia, 85,000 in Yugoslavia, 700,000 in all of Poland. In November 1943, Stryker quoted verbatim an article from the Israelitische Vogelblatt which stated that the Jews had virtually disappeared from Europe and commented, this is not a Jewish lie. In the face of the evidence before the tribunal, it is idle for Stryker to suggest that the solution of the Jewish problem which he favored was strictly limited to the classification of Jews as aliens and the passing of discriminatory legislation such as the Nuremberg Law supplemented, if possible, by international agreement on the creation of a Jewish state somewhere in the world to which all Jews should emigrate. Stryker's incitement to murder and extermination at the time when Jews in the East were being killed under the most horrible conditions clearly constitutes persecution on political and racial grounds in connection with war crimes as defined by the Charter and constitutes a crime against humanity. Conclusion. The tribunal finds that Stryker is not guilty on count one, but he is guilty on count four. The finding on Schacht was delivered by the United States judge, the Honorable Mr. Francis Biddle. It was a very detailed finding drawn up and agreed upon by all the judges of all the four nations constituting the tribunal. Great Britain, the United States, the Soviet Union, and France. Here is the concluding passage of this agreed finding upon Schacht. Schacht was not involved in the planning of any of the specific wars of aggression, charged in count two. His participation in the occupation of Austria and his state land, uh, neither of which are charged as aggressive wars, was on such a limited basis that it does not amount to participation in the common plan charged in count one. He was clearly not one of the inner circle around Hitler, which was most closely involved with this common plan. He was regarded by this group with undisguised hostility. The testimony of Speer shows that Schott's arrest on July 23, 1944, was based as much on Hitler's enmity toward Schott, growing out of his attitude before the war, as it was on suspicion of his complicity in the bomb plot. The case against Schott, therefore, depends on the inference that Schott did in fact know of the Nazi aggressive plan. On this all-important question, evidence has been given for the prosecution and a considerable volume of evidence for the defense. The tribunal has considered the whole of this evidence with great care and comes to the conclusion that this necessary inference has not been established beyond a reasonable doubt. 
conclusion. If the Bureau finds that Schott is not guilty on this indictment and directs that he should be discharged by the marshal when the tribunal presently adjourns. Throughout the morning, the findings were pronounced in this way. In the afternoon came the sentences. Each prisoner was brought in alone, stepped out of the lift, into the dock, and stood with headphones fixed to hear his fate. All the sentences were pronounced by Lord Justice Lawrence. Defendant Hermann Wilhelm Goering, on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the International Military Tribunal sentences you to death by hanging. Defendant Rudolf Hess, on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the tribunal sentences you to imprisonment for life. Defendant Joachim von Ribbentrop, on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the tribunal sentence you, sentences you to death by hanging. Defendant Wilhelm Keitel, on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the tribunal sentences you to death by hanging. Defendant Ernst Kjaldenbrunner, on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the tribunal sentences you to death by hanging. <coughs> Defendant Alfred Rosenberg, on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the tribunal, the tribunal sentences you to death by hanging. Defendant Hans Frank, on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the tribunal sentences you to death by hanging. Defendant Wilhelm Frick, on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the tribunal sentences you to death by hanging. Defendant Julius Stryker, on the count of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the tribunal sentences you to death by hanging. Defendant Walter Funk, on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the tribunal sentences you to imprisonment for life. Defendant Carl Dönitz, on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the tribunal sentences you to ten years in prison. Defendant Eric Rader, on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the tribunal sentences you to imprisonment for life. Defendant Baldur von Schirach, on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the tribunal sentences you to 20 years imprisonment. Defendant Fritz Sarko, on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the tribunal sentences you to death by hanging.
defendant Alfred Yodel on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the tribunal sentences you to death by hanging. Defendant Arthur Sysingquat on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the tribunal sentences you to death by hanging. Defendant Albert Speer on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the tribunal sentences you to 20 years imprisonment. When the final sentence of the International Military Tribunal had been delivered, Lord Justice Lawrence made an unexpected announcement. I have an announcement to make. The Soviet member of the International Military Tribunal desires to record his dissent from the decisions in the cases of the defendants Schacht, Ron Parpin, and Fritcher. He is of the opinion that they should have been convicted and not acquitted. He also dissents from the decisions in respect of the Reich Cabinet and the General Staff and High Command, being of the opinion that they should have been declared to be criminal organizations. He also dissents from the decision in the case of the sentence on the defendant Hess and is of the opinion that the sentence should have been death and not life imprisonment. As the court rose, Chester Wilmot sent us this final dispatch. From Nuremberg. And the final hour of this trial was its most dramatic and significant, and it left upon my mind one outstanding impression. At three o'clock this afternoon, Herman Goring stood in the dock and heard Lord Justice Lawrence pronounce upon him the sentence of death. Goring's face was expressionless as a mask, but his manner was submissive. He had come at last, I felt, not only to accept the justice of the tribunal's verdict, but also to recognize its jurisdiction, that jurisdiction which on the second day of the trial he had sought to challenge and deny. The 17 others who stood one by one in that same dock during the next 40 minutes were equally subdued. Most of those who were sentenced to death took the verdict with apparent resignation. The ribbon top and circle seemed to turn from the dock in a daze. Those who escaped with lesser punishment were less impassive, and some showed obvious surprise and relief. Many of them bowed to the president in acknowledgement of the court's judicial authority. All of them, going as well as the other 17, seemed overawed by the solemn dignity of the final proceedings. As each one appeared from the lift, he stepped out into an empty dock into a courtroom where every eye was upon him and the air was taut with silence that was very disturbed by the quiet judicial voice of the president as he pronounced the sentence. These 18 Nazis who had once helped to rule Europe were very small men as they stood forlorn in the dock, making their last appearance on the stage of history. None dared to make any last-minute protestation of his Nazi faith or of his innocence. Their silent acceptance of the judgment was a recognition of their own guilt and of the justice and sanction of the international law under which they were tried. You have been listening to Judgment in Nuremberg. It came to you in the BBC's home service. This is the British Broadcasting Corporation.